We're now on distinctive feature theory. We have a new handout for this week. Uh, and what this week is going to be about, uh, in broad terms, is about a system for thinking of mental representations speakers of a language use in order to store information and manipulate information about sounds in their language. So by hypothesis, we're going to end up with a set of uh, categorical discrete features that usually have two values. They're either plus feature or minus feature. Uh, and we think that this is at least a good first approach to the problem of what do speakers of a language represent when they're computing information about sounds and sound sequences in their language uh, for the purposes of phonological contrast and grammatical properties. This is probably not true for phonetics in a way that we'll get to shortly. Uh, and so what this unit really is about uh, is about getting from this continuous physical world of the infinite number of ways that we can produce sounds in actual continuous physical space versus the limited number of categorical sounds that seem to occur uh, and the limited number of combinations that categorically do or don't occur within any specific language. So we're going from the continuous to the discrete. Right? And before we get into the fine details of how we think specific features work, so all the specifics of feature theory, um, I want to give quick an over, uh, first a quick overview of why are we doing this in the first place. We already have a bunch of ways of describing sounds. Why are we now coming up with this new theory? Um, and so here's uh, one kind of a justification, and you'll see a couple other uh, supporting arguments for why we want to do things this way later in the materials for this week. But here's a first pass at the problem. If we go out in the world and we just measure uh, how people are producing stops, or also vowels or fricatives or any other sound, uh, but I'm going to use stops as an example here, um, in languages around the world, we would find probably an infinite number of places of articulation. Why? Well, because this is, you know, a representation of your vocal tract, which exists in physical space. Physical space is physically continuous. Right? And there's no reason you couldn't put your tongue tip, for instance, at an infinite number of points along your uh, teeth, alveolar ridge, and the post-alveolar region back to your palate. There's an infinite number of possible stops in there. And so you can have tiny differences between the places of articulation of a sound. Um, and I've given you a bunch of different T graphs from the... Uh, from the uh, uh, IPA here, um, some with diacritics, some without, and these are just representing the fact that all of these are voiceless alveolar stops, or coronal stops rather. They're all going to be made with the tip of the tongue somewhere in the vicinity of, you know, the front part of the teeth, the alveolar ridge, um, or the alveopalatal region. But you can have tiny differences there. We can even write some of these in the IPA. So that first one is a, a setting for a retroflex stop, and that's going to be a little bit further back up here with the tongue tip curled back. In some languages, it might even be made with the bottom of the tongue touching uh, the, the region behind the alveolar ridge. Um, we can have a slightly retracted stop that's like alveolar, but back a little bit. That's what that second diacritic is meant to represent. We can have a plain alveolar stop where the tongue tip is close to this bump, the alveolar ridge. We can have uh, a more dental realization. That's that last diacritic here where we get the tongue tip closer to the teeth here. Um, and in general, I mean, we can write probably eight or 10 or 12 different diacritics or different kinds of IPA characters to represent all these different coronal stops. Um, but really, there's an infinite, continuous variety of places that you could put uh, the front of your tongue in order to make a coronal stop in real physical space. So this is the continuous nature of phonetics. Everything we've looked at, articulation, right, aerodynamics comes in continuous units, the acoustic properties we looked at, frequencies and durations and things like that, uh, and amounts of intensity, these all come in continuous infinite scales, right, these are sometimes called interval scales, where uh, you can pick any value, real numbered value on this scale, right. So this is all going to be continuous, everything about phonetics is continuous, um, and this is just observing that, you know, in principle, there's an infinite number of possible coronal stops out there. Um, this is going to be systematic to some extent within languages. So in general, you might say that most varieties of Spanish, for instance, uh, have a dental 
to sound. Right? That's what this little diacritic is. While most varieties of English have something closer to an alveolar to sound with no diacritic here. Um, but, you know, even within languages, you're going to get some variation here. Um, and here's the observation. We want to be able to talk uh, about the sounds in a language. There's an infinite number of sounds that can be made in any language. Um, however, there are both cross-linguistic tendencies and within language patterns uh, that we need to analyze in less of a continuous space. So, for instance, um, productions of stops uh, tend across languages to cluster in certain regions. Right? So within language, you get fairly few categories with specific targets. So uh, English has this alveolar stop. It doesn't have another coronal stop, or sorry, not another voiceless coronal stop anyway. Spanish has this more usually dental voiceless uh, coronal stop, and it doesn't have any other uh, voiceless coronal stops either. Right? So they tend to cluster around regions in particular languages that have specific targets, where the target here is something like tongue tip to upper teeth, and the uh, target here is something like tongue tip to alveolar ridge. Right? Uh, and then across languages, these also tend to cluster around certain landmarks. Right? So um, we call all of these stops coronal because there's a strong tendency for just about every language to have some kind of a stop that's made by moving around the front part of the tongue uh, towards the front part of the palate or alveolar ridge or teeth, right? Um, and then even, you know, across languages within that coronal place of articulation, we're distinguishing things like dental and alveolar and post-alveolar, retroflex, so on and so forth. Um, because these are all also tendencies that we find for sounds to cluster around across languages. In fact, this clustering is what makes the International Phonetic Alphabet uh, feasible to begin with, right? If there's an infinite number of possible consonant sounds going all the way from here back here, right, then there's not really any way to represent those with letters, right? Because letters are categorical and symbolic, so it would be useless to even have an alphabet to begin with. Um, so in a sense, the IPA already has a theory embedded in it, namely that there are discrete categories of speech sound um, and that we can apply these categories uh, to any language on Earth. Right? Um, so we generally have different characters for major categories. For instance, this would be a coronal stop, while well, this one would be a labial stop. Um, and then we can make tiny adjustments to language-specific details um, like dental versus alveolar, using these kinds of diacritics or the loops that come down off the bottoms of characters or something like that. Right? Um, and so the theory that's already embedded in the fact that we're using the IPA is that we tend to get uh, some discrete categories of consonants and vowels across languages that resemble each other within some margin of error, and we can represent small language-specific differences using a few additional notational devices, but we basically have clusters of categorical sounds that appear in language after language, and that can be distinguished within a language. Right? So the question is, where does this clustering come from, right? Why doesn't English have, you know, a dental stop and a slightly less, re, uh, less anterior dental stop and an alveolar stop and a slightly post-alveolar stop and then an alveopalatal stop and maybe a slightly retroflex stop and then a sublaminal retroflex stop? Why don't we have an infinite number of coronal stops in English? And why don't we find an infinite number of infinitely different coronal stops across languages? Uh, one kind of explanation that we're going to pursue in this class, uh, that feature theory is for, uh, says that, well, sure, we have the physical capability to make all sorts of fine grained distinctions. You can put your tongue tip here, or here, or here, 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 here. Uh, that's physically possible. Um, but we also need to remember which morphemes have which sound in them. Right? So in our mental lexicon that we learn when we're learning a language, I think we need to be able to distinguish uh, words like tip from words like, uh, well, let me not use voicing, let me use place of articulation as an example here. Uh, in fact, let me get a different 
words like tin from words like pin. Now these slashes are meant to indicate lexically stored forms, underlying representations in the lexicon. And it's clear that any speaker of English is able to memorize this word differently from this one because they sound consistently different and they refer to different things. Tin, pin, right? Uh, so we have to store information about this sound in our lexicon in some way. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to distinguish between words like this. And the hypothesis here is that just like the International Phonetic Alphabet, the system that we use for memorizing underlying forms, lexical forms like this, is kind of coarse-grained. It doesn't make use of the infinite degrees of freedom that you have in your vocal tract or in the atmosphere or in your ear. It only makes use of a limited number of sort of coarse categorical features and that's why words and languages don't use an infinite variety of different sounds. They use a fixed number of sounds that can differ by context, can be extremely complicated, can be extremely large, but it's never just, I have one word that refers to a kind of metal that uses an alveolar stop, and then there's a different word that refers to something you push into a wall that has, you know, a slightly retracted uh, alveolar stop, but otherwise is exactly the same, right? and these mean two different things, we don't find these kinds of contrasts. We don't have a contrast between tin with this place of articulation and tin with this place of articulation. doesn't seem to exist. Why? Well, maybe as these IPA characters are meant to suggest, uh, our mental lexicons, the form in which we store things, only make some contrasts available and not an infinite variety of physical configurations. Because if you had an infinite variety of physical configurations that could each define an underlying representation in the lexicon, you'd basically need an infinite amount of memory to even store memorized forms. So assuming that that would be impossible, here's one way of thinking about why we instead get categories uh, and uh, only a limited number of consonants or a limited number of contrasts in every language, uh, it's because we store phonetic information in, uh, you know, at least for the purposes of phonology, in a sort of abstract, coarse-grained, and categorical way. So we can definitely encode the difference between coronal and labial, uh, but maybe we just don't have any features available in our lexical entries for encoding differences between, you know, straight alveolar stop and stop that's one-eighth of the way between the alveolar ridge and the front of the palate. Maybe that's just not the kind of feature uh, that we can store in our lexical entries. Right? Um, so the example in the handout is similar, saying that we can specify voiceless alveolar stop, but not slightly advanced or slightly retracted alveolar stop. Uh, and so the reason we can't have a lexical contrast like this in English or in any other language, where remember, this is basically a made-up diacritic that's supposed to be saying something like, you know, half a millimeter re uh, back from the alveolar ridge. Uh, we don't have a diacritic like this in the IPA, specifically because this doesn't seem to be phonologically meaningful in any language. If it were, we would expect to have contrasts like this in some language where tin means one thing and tin means another thing. Uh, and of course, you can't even hear the difference there because this is a tiny difference. Uh, instead, we don't seem to have contrasts like this in any language, and that's because this kind of a feature doesn't exist in the place where we store our long-term knowledge of sound patterns, or at least our long-term knowledge of lexical items in our mental lexicons. So this is why we think we need a slightly different way of thinking about contrasts, differences between lexical items that can or can't occur, uh, not just in any specific language, but also across languages. The hypothesis here is that uh, we just sort of store these in coarse categorical forms, um, and the formalism that we're going to use to talk about this, which we're going to have to f familiarize ourselves with uh, to pretty painstaking detailed extent for the rest of the semester uh, is 
formalized in terms of distinctive features.